Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 26 of the Stanford MLC seminar series. I'm Karan. We have with us today Dan, Piero, Fyodor, Matei, and our guest today, Tim Kraska from MIT. Um, as always, we're going to have a 30-minute talk followed by, by a 30-minute podcast style discussion where you can ask uh, questions in the live chat. Uh, you can keep those questions coming during the talk and we'll keep track of them uh, as we go along and, and get, get those to Tim uh, during the podcast. Um, so let me introduce uh, Tim. Uh, Tim is going to be talking today about instance optimized uh, data systems, uh, which is uh, starting to bridge the gap between uh, using machine learning for, for uh, databases and data systems. Uh, Tim is an associate professor uh, of Eeks at uh, MIT. Um, leads the um, data system and AI lab and co-founder of a, uh, a company called Einblick Analytics. Um, he's received a bunch of awards and a bunch of best papers, which I won't go through, uh, but great researcher. And we're very excited to have you, Tim, and uh, have you talking about um, instance op optimized data systems. So take it away. Yeah, thanks. And thanks again for having me here. Um, like, I'm also very impressed, actually, that you pronounce Einblick correctly. Uh, we, good job. Um, so like my research is like, uh, you mentioned it's like mainly in the either building data systems for AI or using like machine learning or other testing to build data systems. Um, on the systems for an outside, uh, we like used to do this like big project called Nostar. Uh, now this actually became a company. Um, however, in this talk, I will not focus at all on this. It's more like, uh, our current focus, at least on the research part, is more on how to use machine learning to improve systems, uh, particular data systems. Um, a little bit of motivation behind that. I, we all saw this graph already that like Moore's law is definitely coming to an end. Um, while at the same time, data is continuing increasing. And so the question is like, how do we deal uh, with this? Like we have uh, an increasing demand uh, for analytics on ever growing data. And at the same time, the hardware is not improving at the same uh, pace anymore. And one approach um, to tackling this problem is clearly uh, specialization. Um, there's a lot of excitement right now around like specialization and hardware, uh, GPUs, TPUs, FPGAs and co. Um, like leading the way here. The question we are trying to answer as part of the diesel lab at MIT is just like, can we build more specialized systems to also achieve greater efficiencies? And in the end, this is not even a new idea. Um, the core concept behind it has been around for a long, long time already. Um, if you particularly look at database systems, they are already specialized for like the general category of a workload. For example, we have like uh, OLTP systems like HStore, analytic systems like Snowflake or streaming database systems. And you can see them as a uh, form of specialization for a given workload, right? Like for example, a transactional workload. The question we are raising is like, can you specialize them even more, right? And how would this specialization look like? Um, the simplest form, this is becoming already mainstream is like tuning a system. So every system from Amazon Redshift, Snowflake, SQL Server and co, they have a bunch of knobs and configuration and options to tune the system for a particular workload, right? Like buffer pool size might be one of them, what indexes to create, what material is used to form and so on. Um, and you can tune them to get better performance out of your system. Um, and this like auto tuning for them using like nowadays often machine learning models, like uh, it's becoming actually mainstream and most of the big players have some type of, of service they're already rolled out to do this like self tuning. The next evolution we see is like what we call uh, learned comp uh, components where you look at a particular piece of a, let's say database system, and you try to figure out, okay, how can I build or redesign this particular software component to achieve better performance and, and make it like what we call instance optimized, right? Like, can we, for example, build a query optimizer, which learns from the data and query workload and gets better over time and adjusts itself for just like a given workload um, or data distribution. Um, similar, like, can we do, for example, better indexing? So, like, uh, the idea here is, like, if we know that we want to hyper-optimize a component, would we design the component maybe 
like entirely differently than what has been done so far. Eventually, where we want to get to is what we call instance optimized systems. And this is just like, yeah, create a system which self adjusts to a given data and workload distribution, potentially in ways you wouldn't design a normal system for in a ways that's just like, um, like isn't possible right now. Um, the core idea, for example, is like if you build a system nowadays, often you try to minimize the numbers of knobs you have. Whereas like if you want to build an instance optimized system and we know that something is like self-tuning the whole entire system, maybe like increasing the numbers of knobs, the numbers of options is a good choice, right? It's a big difference like if it's designed for human to interact with that, or if you know that a machine or like a, or some model might tune everything. And this is what we uh, eventually want to end up with. Um, I said in the beginning, this is just like mainly focused on ML for systems, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be machine learning. I want to be a little bit more general here. It's just like what we mean by instance optimized system, like machine learning for systems is a subcomponent of it. In many cases, like plain old optimization is what you need. And that's fine. In the end, what we mean is just like, yeah, let's use the technique which makes more sense in each uh, setting we are, we are targeting. Right? So like machine learning is one of the techniques which is usable, but it's definitely not the only one um, which we can use for building instance optimized systems. Okay, so overall, this area is very, very active right now. Uh, here, a bunch of like recent works um, in, in the space, uh, but some of the components I'm going to talk about today. Um, so unfortunately, like uh, I don't have time to cover all of that. Instead, my goal for this talk is to focus on a, on a few sub pieces. On one hand, I would love to give like a quick progress report on some of the work we are doing around learned index structures. Um, and like where the state of the art currently is and what's still missing. Um, there are many other components, particularly for the second one, like instance optimized components we worked on. Um, I would love to give you a quick overview about uh, SQL query optimization uh, and the work we did in that space, and then wrap everything up about uh, like um, how we factor currently everything into a full instance optimized system, which we call SageDB. Um, and really just like show you some very, very early initial results on that system. Okay, to jump directly in, um, like a quick progress report on learned index structures. So when we published this like original paper roughly three years ago, we got like two types of, of reactions. One saying it's just like the best thing like since sliced bread more or less and almost overhyping it, or what I mean, almost overhyping it for sure. And then also like the more uh, like grumpy responses in quotation marks saying like, oh yeah, they're like, they are flaws with the paper. It's maybe not the most fair ba baseline and pointing on other um, like downsides. And I have to say many of them were right at, uh, on spot because it was very early results, um, which, like people reacted to in like different ways. Um, and three years ago, many of the criticism we got was actually very, very true. Um, so what I would love to do now in the, in like the first half of this talk is just like go very quickly about like the core idea again of the, the paper we wrote about learned index structures and then like where the state of the art is right now. Okay, so quick recap. So with learned index structures, what we did is build like a third, first learned component for indexing. And the core idea was the following. Instead of having a traditional B tree structure where a key comes in and traverses some type of a tree to find some data in the end, um, we said like, hey, can we not replace that using a machine learning model, which takes a key, predicts roughly where the data might be, and then you do some localized search around the prediction to actually find the data item. There are a bunch of assumptions built into this first approach it's like, first of all, we assumed only everything is in main memory. And we also assumed everything is sorted by key. And uh, the reason why we said like it has to be sorted by key is just like we wanted to support range requests, meaning for example, get all the orders in a certain uh, time range, right? So it's like very restrictive. Also read only was our first target, no updates yet. Um, so what's the core idea behind that? It's just like, let's assume we have a, like a table or some data set like this one where we have like orders 
um, this is the address, email address, and so on, um, credit card number, order amount, and then there's like an ID field, which is in this case, roughly an auto increment started at ID 1000. So let's assume I want to build an index to look up very quickly the ID numbers, right? So this is my goal here. Um, on one hand, of course, I could use uh, B-Tree for it. And most databases nowadays, they are still for the primary key index, which this ID column would be. They just put them in the standard clustered index, which normally tends to be some form of a B-Tree. Um, however, if you really look at this, the data here, it's just like they're just auto increments. And if you just want to look up a single ID, you can obviously do better by just remembering when the IDs start. And you can do a very simple offset calculation using any given ID minus 1,000 gives you essentially the offset and you are done. You can even get this if there are some deletes happening because like you still do this offset calculation. And if you're one or two positions off, it doesn't matter that much because you can just search around left and right. Everything is sorted. You will find the data very, very quickly. Right? Um, so let's use a different example. Let's assume like we want to build an index on the date column. So now the question is, how do we do that? Uh, because they are not potentially as nicely um, like organized with just increments of one. And here's like where the model comes in. If you are able to build a CDF model over the date column, we can use the CDF model again to do an offset calculation. Essentially what we do is just like, if you have any key we want to look up, we calculate the probability mass below this particular key we want to look up and multiply it with the total numbers of keys we have, which gives us an like predicted uh, offset. And then again, we use the same idea of just like using some localized search to actually find the key in that. And so that's the core idea behind it. Um, very important to note, this is not an approximate structure because of the final search at the end, it will always guarantee you that you will find the key if it exists. And you can also do like things like the next closest key left or right, right? So it's just like, it can give you the exact same guarantees as what the B tree does. Okay, so what we did essentially is now have a key, put it through a model and we get a, predict a prediction and we do some localized search and we can get the same guarantees back. Um, so what types of models to use? And this was like another uh, smaller contribution of the paper. It's just like, yeah, in the end, whatever works, we just found that in most cases, uh, sorry, one back here, um, that linear models do extremely well. So one structure we came up with is what we call the recursive model index. The idea is you first train a model on, over the entire data. You use this prediction of the model to pick another model, which is now only trained on a subset of the data. Right? And so we can layer these like models on top of each other. And they can be in the end, whatever you want to use. In many cases, just like linear models are fine. Um, and what I show you here at the bottom is a very simple RMI, which consists of one linear regression at the top. And then based on the uh, linear regression position estimate, we pick the next linear regression model, and then we do the localized search. Um, this two-stage RMI just like consists of two multiplications, two additions, and one area lookup. So it's extremely fast. That's the whole inference. Right? This is like really roughly the code we use in the model itself. If you compare that to what it takes to traverse a, a B tree, you normally have much more instructions, even if you strong, uh, like highly optimize it. Okay, um, so this was the original evaluation we had, um, like one of them at least, which essentially shows the trade-off between like our learned index approach versus like other alternative approaches in the space. Uh, where you want to be here is on the left bottom. The y-axis is the index size. The x-axis is the lookup performance. So lower uh, left is where you want to be. And like for the data set we tested there, it's just like we saw that like learned indexes actually does pretty well. Um, so when we published that, as said, there were a bunch of critics. And many of them were also very valid at that point in time. Like, for example, there was a question about like, what are the baselines? And there are a bunch of optimizations like done since the, the AD 90s when B trees came out and you, like, you couldn't take like all of them into consideration. Um, there's a question about theoretical foundations. So why are they actually smaller or faster? There's a question about like update support. So great thing about B-trees obviously are that they provide you great performance in the presence of updates. 
can you guarantee something similar? And then a really big one was as well as just like, hey, um, like, does it actually matter that you have smaller indexes, particularly for read-only workloads? Do they play any importance in real applications? Um, there were a bunch of other uh, things which came up, but uh, very quickly in this talk, I will only focus on those four points. Yeah. So um, the first one is just like about baselines. Actually, we went back and did an exhaustive study with two Munich together, where we compared the learn structures and new variants of learn structures, which are called uh, PGM, Redixstein, a bunch of others of them, uh, against like a range of traditional indexes over a range of like real world data sets as well as synthetic ones. And the main takeaway is that like, yeah, the learned approaches actually indeed do better um, across all these real uh, world data sets. There's one exception and I come to that at the end, but like overall the results were uh, pretty much holding up uh, for different data sizes, different hardware configurations and so on. So we went back for that. Uh, part of that is now actually also backed up by theory. For example, there's this nice paper uh, by Paolo, which uh, showed that with high probability, uh, if the models learn something about the underlying distributions, the indexes will be smaller by providing the same type of um, like lookup performance. And this is like the, this is particularly true for the PGM index they developed, which is a little bit different from the um, I ones I showed you earlier, because that one is actually created um, bottom up instead of top down. Yeah. Um, the next big question was just like about updates. And there has been a whole bunch of work uh, since we published the original paper to address that issue. Here's just like a small collection of papers, uh, like I didn't even update it in a while, um, about like approaches on where people extended the idea and try to incorporate updates. Um, one thing I wanted to mention here is that actually it turned out that in some cases, um, the performance of updates can be better than a traditional B tree. And that's normally the case when the models learn something about the like underlying data distribution, because then in contrast to a B tree where you have to like normally to rebalance the tree based on the inserts, if you learn something about the underlying distribution, actually the uh, like you don't necessarily have to retrain and then you get the benefit of it. So uh, like it's almost counterintuitive. You would think like, okay, the model updates is like what really hurts it. It just depends on if you have a, a model shift, a distribution shift. If you have a distribution shift, it can get much worse. If you don't have one, actually you can show it's, it might be better. Okay? So it just depends on the setup again. So the next one, do smaller or faster indexes even matter? Um, obviously the hard size, it depends. There are some cases for smaller uh, learned index structures where the performance might matter. And this is, for example, a nested loop join. So we, uh, there's a postdoc of mine, Ibrahim, currently working on that. Um, he shows just like for like a nested loop join, yeah, this like few nanosecond savings you might get helps you a little bit in, in for example, join performance. Um, but in many cases, like saving a few nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds here, just like in the grand scheme of like a, a query analytical processor, it like doesn't matter at all. Right? However, the smaller index sizes can have a significant impact. And uh, that is like also a surprising result to us. Like for example, we, we saw that um, like there's this recent integration of learned index structures into Google Bigtable um, by uh, Hassam and Denise. And they show that they can get up to a, like a 50% speed up in throughput as well as like a reduction in uh, CPU consumption through the like learned index structures. And the main reason for that being is that um, they can in certain situations avoid an uh, uh, disk access. So if the index is so much smaller that it now entirely fits into my memory on all the machines you need it, you don't have to fetch the, the, disk, uh, the, the second half of the index anymore. So in their case, it's actually, it's like normally they have a two level index is if they have a root node and then there's a second one. Um, and if you make the indexes so much smaller, you get this advantage that you might save one IO. Right. Um, interestingly, that also helps them to save CPU cost, um, mainly because like everything they do on disk is like compressed 
And then every single time you have to uncompress something, it costs you a bunch of CPU resources. Um, similar effects was like recently shown in like um, improving uh, log structure merge, merge trees, like particular uh, this Bourbon paper from Wisconsin is applying the idea of learned indexes for like a system like RocksDB and they show get, that they get benefits from it for a very, very similar reason, which is just the smaller index size. Yeah. So are there any real limitations? Uh, certainly they are. They are the, the one which stands out the most is when the model can your, uh, cannot use continuous functions to like probably uh, like uh, approximate the distribution. And one of the cases is for duplicates. So as more duplicates you have in your data set, the harder actually this approximation using continuous function works because like essentially what duplicates do is they create step functions, right? Like you have the same value over and over again, then you jump to the next value and then you have the same value a couple of times again, and then you jump to the next one. So it creates the step function and where the step happens is like almost random, right? Um, and a tree is perfect for that because it only needs to remember one position and then it remembers when the next step happens. Whereas like if you use any continuous functions like the linear model or anything else you want to put through that, the steps essentially like get into the way. And um, it turns out like, yeah, every single time you have a ton of duplicates, this like model-based approach normally doesn't work that great. Uh, there are workarounds, but um, overall, if you have a data set with a ton of duplicates, one of the traditional structures often works better, or at least like the new Redix based ones. Okay, um, so it's a very active research area. There are a bunch of papers coming currently out in that whole space. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into detail with them. Instead, I would like to focus on what I'm actually even more excited about right now is multidimensional indexing. Because I think like the, the single dimensional case is restricted per definition. You can build like a, in the end, just like one clustered index out of it because there's still a strong assumption that the whole data is sorted by the key you, you want to look up, right? It's just like, even if you have a secondary index, doesn't necessarily help that much because the data, you need to still have the leaf pages which scramble everything around. So what do I mean by multidimensional indexes? It's like the idea is here the following, let's assume like I have the data set similar to before. Um, I have some, let's say user data. I want to look users up by salary or age. And now queries come in and might look into any of these dimensions, right? And so what I want is like figure out the best way to store my data as well as the best way to build indexes on top of it in order to support queries which touch either age, salary, or a combination of the two. So this is the, the rough setup. Um, this, the obvious simple thing I can do is just like I sort it by one of the dimensions. Right? Or like, so let's assume like I do the following first. I don't sort it at all. In that case, I need to scan everything because I don't, I don't have any order. It's just like if I put things in as they come, just like if I want to look up something between the age range of 40 to 50 and a certain salary range, I have to scan every single record uh, which is in there. Um, maybe better might be that I sort everything by age. But if I do that, I still need to uh, scan all the different salary attributes which are not in my band, right? Because I don't know where they are. Otherwise I can sort by salary, but now if I look up a certain range, I still have this like scan overhead, which is here um, like shown as red, which is like, I still have to uh, scan all these like records which don't match my, um, uh, my age or my salary range, depending on which sort order I use. So ideally what I would love to do is like, maybe I can split the data in a different way. For example, enforce this grid structure over it. And now if I have this little grids, I can reduce the amount of data I have to scan if, I, if a certain query comes in. But the key question becomes here is just like, how do I define this grid structure? How wide do I make every cell? How narrow do I make every cell? Uh, just like it's there, as you can see, thousands of different options or like where do I move the boundaries? So this is the, the rough idea behind uh, for, uh, FLAT and Tsunami, two of our papers in that space. 
for flat, what we did essentially, we take a workload. This is like indicated by this like um, this green boxes here. This, let's assume that's a sample workload. And then based on the workload we observe, we impose a grid structure over that, which finds a good compromise for like how many boxes I have to scan to narrow them down so that I like they minimize the scan overhead in the sense of like records which don't fall into the query range for every single query which comes in. So like, for example, in workload A, it tries to do very narrow uh, blocks, whereas in workload B, uh, B it um, takes this like column types of formats to minimize the overhead I have. And this is completely done automatically. So recently we expanded that idea because we observed that um, in some cases, you have certain query patterns over different subsets of the data. For example, if I have an analytical workload, it's very likely that my queries over the last month will be different from the queries over the last year. Right? And so with the new work tsunami, we now like are more flexible with like the grid structure because we can find different grid layouts for subsets of the data. There's flat, on the other hand, always try to figure out the best uh, like average, like the best compromise for the entire data set. Just to give you uh, a little bit of like uh, results for that one, this paper actually is appearing at uh, Zigmund this year. Um, here are like two different data sets. One is taxi, one is a performance monitoring data set. Um, we compare different types of um, multidimensional index structures, like from clustered, which is essentially a hierarchy of partitionings, KD trees, hyperoctree, Z order encoding, um, then flat or previous approach and tsunami. Um, all of them are actually tuned for the workload. So like we, we made sure that, for example, if you build a hierarchical cluster, that we use the, the right order of attributes to get the best performance for each approach. And what you see here is just like the tsunami is like up to two orders of magnitude faster than the alternative approaches. Um, and this also holds true for like other commercial data sets we tried. Interestingly, it, like uh, often, um, if you have a certain data warehouse and it supports clustered indexes, for example, users uh, tend to optimize for whatever the system supports. So depending on, on uh, the workload you have, you see like other approaches going better or worse. Right? Um, but like this is just to give you a rough idea. Um, <clears throat> comparing it particularly also again in this, uh, on the axis between index size and average query performance, um, you can see that like what you wanna be here is again on the left lower bottom. Um, that tsunami again, does like very well compared to the alternative approaches. And here, what we actually did with the alternative approaches is like we tried to tune them regarding to the index size. For example, if you have a hyperoctree, you can uh, make the hyperoctree like different levels deep. Like um, the question is how much you, you go down. And again, you see like it's, we, we end up in a pretty good place because this index structure is actually optimized uh, for the workload as well as the data distribution. Okay, so I quickly go over the SQL query optimizer and then I already will wrap up. Um, so like this is another project uh, which we are currently working on in Diesel. It's about how to improve query optimization. Um, the traditional query optimizers take a SQL query, they pass it, they put it through like normally a bunch of rules which optimize the query and create a physical query plan. Then this one gets executed and then you get at some point some result back. Uh, the problem is query optimizers make mistakes. And as you can see here, there's absolutely no feedback loop. So like if the query optimizer does something wrong, for example, it underestimates the cardinality, it's not learning from it and it will make the same mistakes again the next time. We did this work called Neo, where we essentially built a learned model and try to create this feedback loop. So it's just like it uses three convolutional networks in order to learn over time uh, what works and what doesn't and learn from the mistakes. The only downside of that approach is that it took like a long, long time to train. And uh, at least on how we did the feature representation back then, every single time there's a schema change or anything, the whole thing needs to be retrained again. So we tried to figure out like a way on how to first reduce the training time and second, also make the decision more understandable 
uh, to like the, for example, database administrator or developer, what the query optimizer does, because at least in this approach, it was like a black box, whereas in the traditional one, at least you have some idea why something is going wrong. So this brings us to Bao, which was our latest attempt to it. And we believe it's the first practical approach for learning based query optimization. The idea is here is the following, that we still put the queries through a traditional query optimizer, but then we create variants of the traditional query optimizer using a hint set. So essentially we, we take a traditional query optimizer and say like, don't use nested loop joins. Don't do a, a, a merge join or something else. So we create variants of a traditional optimizer, which have like certain like features of the default configuration turned off. And then each of these traditional query optimizers plus the hint sets creates for us a, a query plan. And now we build the model at the end to estimate on how long the runtime of each of these query plans would be. And now we, on top of it, we have a bandit based approach, which tells you which query optimizer to use under which condition. And so over time, essentially we learn what hint sets to use for what query. For example, we learn that this type of query often gets it wrong uh, in the traditional optimizer, better to never use the nested loop join here. Uh, and through this, this feedback loop, um, this like optimizer now learns, but at the same time, we still leverage the knowledge which is in a traditional query optimizer as much as possible. So we don't need to re, uh, we don't need to train the whole model from scratch. Um, this has a bunch of advantages. First of all, the training time goes way down. Um, we evaluate it against like various um, other databases, and we found that like with this approach, we can improve the query optimizers on these other databases without changing the system. For example, if you see here the top left one, which shows like the query performance of Bao against the uh, Redshift, um, this is actually Bao running on Redshift. So it's, the only thing we did here is like we augmented the Redshift query optimizer using our approach. And then over time learn when to turn off certain features of the Redshift query optimizer, right? So it's all run on the Redshift runtime. And what you see is just like we beat the Redshift optimizer, uh, like it's roughly between like 20%, something around that. And this holds true also for other systems like Vertica, DB2, SQL Server. Um, and uh, for like time as well as cost, and the cost here is important, includes the cost for the GPU to run, uh, train the model. So even with the GPU time, we, we get a positive um, benefit here. Uh, regarding training time, um, this is like showing the uh, Postgres optimizer on the Postgres database, the Neo optimizer on the Postgres database, as well as Bao. And what you see here is just like that Bao almost from the beginning outperforms the standard Postgres optimizer, whereas our previous full end-to-end learn-based approach took a very, very long time until actually it paid off and um, like was better than Bao. Okay, so, um, oh, no, I don't do this. Um, now, just to quickly wrap up. So far, I showed you that we are looking into just like separate components. Actually, if you take this like typical database architecture, by now for each of these like blue boxes, I can at least name you one paper which tries to improve one of these like database components using some type of machine learning or optimization method. Um, that recently appeared. But still what's not addressed yet is how can we actually put everything together into a first instance optimized system? Like, and are there any interactions between the different components or what would you design differently? And this is like the, the thing we are currently trying to uh, address with SageDB. It's like, we want to build a first like, like instance optimized database system. First, we, we thought like we built it from scratch but then it would also take us like at least seven years until we get something which is usable. So instead we opted for like, hey, can we not build an instance optimized accelerator for an existing database? And we pick Postgres here as an example. So like the, the idea is that we integrate into Postgres as an accelerator. So you get the full Postgres SQL interface and the full functionality. So all your workload still, uh, still works as expected 
but then we intercept certain type of queries and store them in our infrastructure and speed them up using instance optimization with all these like different components. Um, this is the current status. So um, we already have like the block storage optimization. We have some compiled execution engine. Uh, we learn like uh, encodings right now. Bao actually recently also got interest, uh, integrated in our approach. So we already do use the learn query optimization. And so step by step, we are trying to bring all these components together in order to fully uh, like, um, optimize everything at once based on the like, workload as well as data distribution. Um, here are some very, very initial results um, that show like currently at the SageDB, we are roughly eight times faster than uh, a highly tuned uh, commercial analytics database in the cloud. Um, it's just like we try to keep most of the hardware and everything the same. Um, I also should mention here the highly tuned one, the way they get the performance is through a whole bunch of materialization. So like essentially create a bunch of materialized views. Whereas like if you would use the more standard configuration without creating all these materialized views, actually we are already much faster than just uh, 8x. Um, this still doesn't like the results here still don't include um, the learned query optimizer, there's no learned multidimensional indexes, uh, there are no partial materialized joins, a whole bunch of optimizations which we haven't done yet in, in for this result. At the same time, I also just want to emphasize again, it's very early preliminary results, like there are a whole bunch of optimizations we still need to do, but it gives you at least like an indication what the potential might be. Um, to conclude, like all the credit for everything in this talk definitely goes to my students and postdocs. Um, like I particularly want to point out that Andreas and Ryan will be on the job market, so you should definitely look out for them. Uh, also, thanks to a lot of collaborators, which I even didn't put here on the slides. Um, one other thing I quickly want to highlight before I stop is uh, we have a workshop a uh, tutorial workshop on ML for systems at VLDB. So the idea of this workshop is not that you submit your new work there, like things which are not ready for prime time. Rather, we want to have a set of speakers talk about past work they did in that space. And uh, the nomination site is still up. So if you want to nominate a speaker um, to be included in this like tutorial workshop, please do so uh, ideally as soon as possible so that we can still invite them. And with that, thank you. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Kim. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, yeah, I want to remind everybody in the audience that you can uh, send in your questions um, in the live chat. So just to kick things off, I guess uh, one thing I was curious about was um, in general, like obviously machine learning based, you know, anything depends on uh, historical data and this idea that like, you know, the future kind of resembles the past. Um, so I was wondering if you could a comment on, uh, you know, the cost of building um, these learned um, index structures and 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 what that takes, and and in particular this kind of idea that like you know it's it's dependent on the historical data and like uh, you may have to rebuild these indexes and and whether that's something that you thought about uh, doing efficiently and and how that plays into kind of real workloads that people might have. Um, certainly. So like, I think most workloads have some type of predictability. I mean, like it's like, I mean, like there might be events which change them overnight, which can happen. Um, but like the usual operation, you say like, yeah, otherwise you cannot plan anything, right? Like if you deploy an OLTP system, you, you make over the guess about how predictable it are, what's the maximum workload you expect and so on. So in that sense, we play into that. The second question is just like, how quickly can you retrain? And that highly depends on what you're using. So that was the main motivation, for example, for Bao was how quickly can we retrain if something changes? Um, with Neo, for example, a, a single like schema change in the at least the first naive version we had would take almost an entire day to retrain. And you can come up with a bunch of tricks to speed that up, but like it's still a long time. Bao is much, much better already. Um, the learned index structures, like the, the index structure itself is pretty quickly retrained overall. It's just like PGM, Redix blind, they are now one pass algorithms. Like they, it's, it's not more expensive than a B tree. There's the multidimensional one is a little bit more complicated because there's the cost of moving data and reorganizing. 
right? And so like now, if you come up with a multidimensional layout, which sorts the data in a very complex way, and now the sorting is not optimal anymore, how do you resort everything and reshuffle? Um, there's some recent work we did uh, in that space where we limit the, the budget you have for resorting, but yeah, it, it all depends. Um, Hey, Tim, uh, actually, uh, related to that last point that you were mentioning about kind of some of the costs of, uh, you know, moving data around, um, it seemed like the, the first two projects that you were talking about, one of them, uh, you kind of use machine learning to uh, predict, like, where I expect data to be on disk. And then the other project with the multidimensional indices, you use machine learning to say, how should I put data on disk and, and where should I put it in storage? Um, so I am curious, uh, have you thought at all about kind of co-designing those two aspects? Um, and, uh, you know, trying to uh, put the data on disk in a way that will be easy for some learned algorithm to figure out where it is and uh, vice versa. That's an excellent point. Um, we thought about it, but I wouldn't say that we do it right now. So like right now, it's more like we determine the layout and then we use like learn structures on top of it um, in order to more efficiently find it. But you are totally right. There should be co-optimized. And it's uh, just a question like how to best do it. There was a very early effort we had at Google at some point, which tried to do that, but this was still for a one dimensional case and it didn't help that much. Um, the, the interesting part nowadays is like for, again, one dimensional, not multidimensional, one dimensional case is um, the, how, for example, the Alex, this like updatable index structure works is they built a model over the data and then they use the model they built to determine where the data goes. So the model is never wrong, right? So instead of having the model in the final search, you, you build a model over it and then use the model to determine where the data is actually placed. And this is a form of what you said, it's not co-optimizing, but like now you don't have the search problem anymore, right? And for, for many of these, these cases, this actually turns out to be a, kind of interesting idea. There's one downside to it, which is like now scan performance might go down because like you might have areas where no data is placed and you need to skip over them. So they use like bit arrays and other things. Well, thanks for your hey, Tim. Yeah. Hey, hey, Tim, really great talk. Uh, I had a, a different kind of question. So at the seminar, we've had a lot of talks about uh, infrastructure for developing ML applications more easily or monitoring them, making sure they're good, like ML ops. How, you know, what was your experience, especially in something like SageDB? Like, are you guys spending a lot of time doing the traditional ML debugging type things, you know, dealing with overfitting or things like that? Or is that actually, you know, everything's designed to be pretty much autonomous, so you never have to worry about those? So I, I think for us, like the, the models are normally not uh, like, the answer is a little bit more complex. It's just like the, the models and data, like the typical problems, for example, you have for an, like creating a model for image classification or other things like the, the lineage tracking, what parameters you use. Normally it's less important for us. Like often the things we can train are very quickly. We, we don't require like large GPU clusters. It's like most of the time it's all in the CPU and it's just fine. You know, like many of these problems, at least what we try so far are not like that problematic for us. Uh, that said, like I remember very vividly certain types of bugs. Like for example, like you, you, you create a model for the indexing structure and this thing is just damn slow. Uh, and so like the first attempt uh, or the first reaction is just like, yeah, that, uh, you know, just like the whole approach doesn't work. However, what was really happening is there's just like the precision, like you did the division in the wrong way. So the precision wasn't high enough or you get like an overflow from negative space to positive, like some, mm -hmm. some strange thing. And now the rest of the code actually corrects that mistake, right? So like, if you remember, um, that like uh, the, the learned index idea is like you get a key in, you put it through a model, you get an offset estimate. If the offset estimates would be always like minus 10 million, it would still work. It just doesn't know mm -hmm. in your yeah. search, right? Um, and those are the ones which are really hard to get because it's just like it's the system works correctly. You get the answer, you get the right answer. There's nothing like accuracy in our case because it's self-correcting still. 
right? But like, yeah, the model doesn't do what it should do. And, and that creates all the problems. So there's definitely something of it in, in the whole thing. And I can, the crew optimization, everything else has like similar issues. So to some degree easier, easier and in other ways harder. Mm -hmm. Got it, cool, yeah. So Tim, are you saying that at some point we'll end up with a system where all the subsystems are sort of misbehaving, but the end result might turn out to somehow still work? That might actually be true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, like, it's, it's not super uncommon, like, I mean, like, this is the thing. If you deal with something which is approximate, but you need to give a fixed result, now you put some safeguards in which correct everything, right? And so by nature now, we do that all the time. So like, if, for example, our, the query optimizer we have would never output a plan which is not valid, right? But maybe the, the long query optimizer would never do anything useful because there's some bug, but everything gets still corrected in the end because that's on how we guarantee that the right semantics, right? I think that it's also already true for many machine learning models. If you think about any, any subgroup of neurons in a neural network, they are doing something wrong. And then in the end, we aggregate them in a way that makes sense, right? Th that's true. Um, but like often the neural networks, at least in many cases, you, you like many of the models are for problems where you kind of expect you don't have a perfect, symmetrically correct result. And therefore like it's like you get the raw output and you see the accuracy drop and you know something is wrong. Um, whereas in our case, it would be the performance drops, I guess, because the result is still correct, which is not exactly the same, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> Actually, in, uh, this I think leads to a question that I was thinking about during your talk um, regarding the work on the query planner. Um, if I understand correctly, you know, the, basically you use the um, usual, um, let's say classical query planners to have a set of candidates on which you, you, you then compute the actual performance and then you use that as training data for like improving the system, right? Right. And I'm curious about the fact that, you know, for instance, in other combinatorial problems, like for instance, Go, for instance, uh, that was the approach at the beginning where there was like some right. expert tuned data that was in this case, the games from actual players that was used and that led to certain really good results, right. but then got rid of it at a certain moment in time. And I'm curious if this, you believe that the same kind of trend could apply also for the learned query planner. I, I think it could, yes. Like, I, I mean, like interestingly, we started out with the end-to-end -end learned one, and now we went actually a step back because of the training time it takes. Uh, I still think there should be a way that you train a, like, um, there's a bunch of work for like, for example, improving cardinality estimates. The problem is just like, just because you improve cardinality estimates doesn't mean that you necessarily improve query performance, mm -hmm. right? So like it's the cardinality estimates, I'm not um, like they only matter if they change the query plan in the end, right? So like you, you can get much better estimates, but they might not change the query plan because the ranking still stays the same. Um, at the same time, they are like, uh, normally if you have a query optimizer, you have a cost model, which just like, it's an estimate on how well the query plan wo uh, works. Like it's just like an estimate on how long it will run. So I think ideally what we want to end up with is like almost a co-training of a cardinality estimate model and a cost model, which work together to improve the overall query performance. And the nice thing about that would be that the cardinality model is data dependent, whereas the cost model probably isn't. Mm -hmm. Right, and now you get better transferability between one setting to the next, which solves the new problem in a different way. Right, because like now you get a better model, which is like something which is data dependent and workload dependent, a piece which isn't maybe just hardware dependent, and now you don't need to train everything at once anymore. You only need to retrain one sub piece of it, and like eventually, I think we should get there. So I see hope as you what, what you said with Go. Like, yeah, there is a path forward. Um, we, we still don't know yet if it works and we haven't done it yet. Right, right, right. I think one of the possible problems there, it could be the fact that, you know, um, if the combination, if the, you know, the candidates uh, query plans that you have to execute are really bad, then, you know, the execution time will be really slow. And so collecting that data, it's yeah. it not a problem, right? So right, that's right. Like an interesting point. And one last thing that I wanted to ask about this, this specific topic that I'm super interested in is, so you're talking about going to the direction of instance-based optimization, right? And that to me feels like something extremely, you know, um, um, interesting to get 
although you may obtain that by brute forcing the problem and creating a model for each single instance, right? Maybe there is something that is in between, right? Or something that is a meta model that adapts dynamically for the query and curious if you yeah. follow about this direction or around. Yeah, now uh, I am, I'm also with you on that front. So like if for uh, query optimization as a sub problem, I always thought there should be a model which works across and then it's refined for the different workloads. And yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Again, great research problem and yeah. Yeah, exactly. same intuition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they work ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's it's right. It should be possible and somebody should do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um one thing I was thinking through the talk was uh I was wondering when do you think we're gonna start seeing uh more instance operate uh, or instance optimized systems? Do you think we'll ever see instance optimized operating systems, instance optimized browser? Do you think my laptop or my phone will ever learn how to run faster or more efficiently? Uh, based on you know my own personal usage, um, yeah, because yeah. you know I, there are seven billion instances of those in the world. I uh, that's a very interesting question. I'm also thinking about like I I don't think that we are close yet. I mean like it's like uh, I think it will take some time, particular to develop the trust that people believe that actually works out. Just like manage the development complexity. So like I, I think like normally. Like, we don't even have a single instance optimized system yet to show like, hey, how much potential is there, right? Like somebody, like we, we are working on it and I hope more people will join that similar efforts. It's just like showing how much can you gain by building a full system with that. Um, but it will, it will simply take time. And if you think about like normally the saying is it's building a database system takes seven years. Um, like this at least gives you a rough idea. Uh, what I'm excited about is just like that you see like subcomponents of learn like learned pieces appearing in commercial products. Like for example, learned indexes integrated in big table. I mean, like it's, like this is um, like this happened. They see some benefits, which which is great, right? Or like um, there's like a lot of like thinking at uh, Microsoft, for example, they have a bunch of papers around like storage optimization. So they, they don't do any multidimensional indexes or anything like that, but they take the workload and they figure out how to split it into blocks on, let's say a cloud storage device, right? And, and I think that's getting pretty close by now uh, that it's rolled out. Like the whole thing will definitely take much longer. Cool, well, thanks. Um, Tim, I wonder if you, like continuing in that vein, I wonder if you could, you know, comment on how you see the kind of next five, 10 years panning out. And, and specifically, I think also you showed some results on your last slide for StageDB that were, seemed pretty exciting, you know, like those uh, speed ups that you were getting and, and also um, the, uh, the storage costs that you showed. So, so I'm curious, you know, like where, when do you think, and, and this was also a question, like when do you think you'll get broad adoption of something like SageDB and, and uh, more sp like specifically, I think uh, in the next five, five, 10 years, how do you see kind of data systems changing? Um, you, you talked about Microsoft and Google doing certain things with their cloud offerings, but, but, uh, but broader adoption um, beyond those. A big players. Right, um, so like, I think there are two pieces of it. It's just like one is SageDB and one is just like broader even cloud providers. Um, I think for SageDB, like the reason why we did this in Postgres is mainly that we wanted to have something which is like usable early on. So like the, the easier thing would have been just like start from scratch, create a prototype, run TPCH and get some numbers out. Um, but the problem with that approach is also that um, like all these synthetic benchmarks which have been used in the past, like essentially they don't apply anymore. Right? It's just like it's it, in many cases it's actually way too easy to learn them and over optimize for them. In fact, you can actually argue that the current commercial systems are over optimized for like they're over the instance optimized for the benchmarks. So like if you take if you take Bao or Neo for TPCH, we normally don't see a, a benefit at all because every single database vendor optimize the query optimizer to make no mistakes on the TPCH benchmark, right? So it's like a form of instance optimization which happened by hand. And now you take some other real work benchmark and yeah, suddenly you see benefits, right? So we, we thought it was extremely important that we get something which we can actually give people. And at least as the first step, we are thinking of shadow deployments, meaning 
ideally have somebody with a Postgres instance running, create a copy of the database in the background, have the running in parallel in the shadow and see on how they behave, right? So this is, this is our plan right now to see on how well it performs. And we, we plan similar things for subcomponents like BAO, like, they, like we are working with some of the large internet companies together to see like on how that works in the background, right? Um, so um, so that's that's uh, the step there. It's, it's like it still will take a little bit, but like it's it, the first version. Our hope is that we get something by the end of the year, like fully fledged out, and then there are tons of improvements we can do afterwards. Um, the cloud providers, I, I think, they are realize that like a lot of the money is actually in 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 the data storage itself. So like as, as Mike Stormbreaker always says, it's like the EC2 or compute is a race to the bottom because there's no distinguishing factor, but the money is made in, in anything which has to do with data storage and, and analytics and sitting on top because in the moment the data is there, it's very hard to migrate somewhere else. And so all the cloud providers, like in my opinion, should be looking at the techniques because it gives them a competitive edge. And just like if, if somebody tells you like, yeah, my cloud is like 10x cheaper than the other one, right? Uh, or faster or whatever. It's just like, yeah, it gives them a big advantage. And so there's definitely a lot of interest from all the big providers in that space. Um, like I, I think everybody is exploring it to one, one form or the other. And then of course it's all stepwise, like, like instance optimization whole system that's far out, but just like you can start slow. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I think we have a time for one last question if anybody wants to get their question in. Um, but um, otherwise, Mate, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, I think this is an awesome talk. Great, uh, you know, great coverage of a lot of really interesting work. So, thanks, awesome. Mate. Yeah, I, 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 I do remember the slide where I, I saw that Matei's name was on the right and uh, <laughs> that was a, a yeah. funny moment. No, but, I, was, I was more skeptical at first, but now I'm not. I think it's really cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we also went back and did all the hashing work again. Because, like, uh -huh. The hashing is a really cool problem in the end. So like, back then, we also didn't fully understand it. But the thing is, so you can improve. Uh, uh, here's the funny thing. If you build a model, mm -hmm over the data, the model learns the data distribution, the underlying data distribution. If you use it as a hash function, it can never be better than a normal hash function. It's like you can prove it's never ever better, right? Uh, if your model overfits to the distribution, then you can reduce the numbers of conflicts. So essentially what it comes mm -hmm. down to is how predictable is the spacing between keys? And then it's independent of actually even what hash function you use, like your cuckoo hashing or anything, you get a little bit of benefit out of it. But like, it's, it's not a lot. It's just a, it's a tiny bit, um, which is mainly interesting because the hash function is order preserving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think the results on Bloom filters are also really interesting, or these kinds of filters. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. There is like Michael Mitzenmacher started to do a bunch of work in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Tim, for for joining today, and thanks for uh, you know uh, giving the talk. Really interesting kind of overview of of this uh, whole direction. Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for tuning in today. If you haven't already, go to mlsystems.edu, sign up to the mailing list, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and get us to five thousand subscribers. And uh, um, Next week, we'll have Evan Olbridge from uh, NVIDIA talking about deep learning based recommender systems. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks again.